The following series is meant as pure fan fiction, and in no way does it share the views of anyone else or those involved in this story. Before watching this episode, please go back and watch 1994 Part 1 and 2, as well as 1995 and 1996 to get the full story that we have worked up to at this point. Please proceed to watch those videos now if you haven't before watching 1997. We will start with a recap of 1996. Kurt and Courtney are officially divorced. Custody of Francis Bean is split between the two parents, with Courtney Love staying in Seattle for the time being, and Kurt moving to a home outside of L.A., where he can remain reclusive. Nirvana is back together with all four members, and by the spring of 1996, recording of a new Nirvana album begins in Kurt Cobain's private studio he had built into his house. Kurt has short hair now, a look we have never seen from him in real life. He is still on methadone, but hasn't touched heroin since 1994. Tensions rise within the band as they attempt to record a new album consisting of old material. Kurt has memory loss issues due to extensive drug problems. Courtney Love has most of Kurt Cobain's old home demo recording tapes in their Lake Washington home. They were left there after the divorce. Dave Grohl wants to pursue his own band, Foo Fighters, but at the time agreed to finish this new Nirvana record before he moves on with his own band. Dave Grohl eventually grows tired of the tensions of growing in the band and moves on to pursue Foo Fighters. Going on a full-fledged U.S. tour with the band, Pat Smear would join. Kurt fired Dave Grohl from the band, and Chris Novoselic, Decides he would step down from Nirvana, leaving Kurt as the sole member of the band. Kurt would then overdose on Rohypnol in October of 1996. He miraculously survived this overdose as well. Cobain decides he wants to scrap the entire album and start fresh, but after extensive meetings with the label, he reluctantly agrees to release the work that was recorded due to the financial gain it will give him in the hard times he is currently facing forcing Kurt to release a blatantly unfinished Nirvana record. Cobain names the new Nirvana record Rohypnol, basically making fun of himself and his overdose the previous month. The album would release Christmas Day, 1996. This brings us to 1997. January, 1997. The new album... Rohypnol has hit the shelves and the airwaves. It's been about two weeks since the initial release. The reviews are mixed, with a massive divide in the fan base. Fans are unsure what to make of this album. Are Nirvana alive, or did they break up? The people who really benefit from this album in this timeline is us, the fans. We get one more album. We have a new branch of songs to add to the catalog to add to the mythology, to add to the legend. Unfortunately, in our real timeline, this album never happens. and leaves fans wanting something like this for 30 years. The songs themselves will stand the test of time. Fantastic melodies and progressions. Most people are just mad that Nirvana would release some of these great new songs but never give us the opportunity to see them live. It feels more like a tribute, a send-off to the Nirvana everyone loves. This album says goodbye. This album is a suicide note for Nirvana itself. The album debuted at number one on Billboard and sold over 400,000 copies in its first week. The album did very well and was considered by some fans as the return of grunge, yet a very bittersweet ending as well. This album feels like Nirvana telling us it's okay to say goodbye to what we love. 
Do Re Mi is the top single on the album. It is Nirvana's newest hit song and has taken over the airwaves on FM radio. Kurt is pressured to compile a video of old Nirvana footage to accompany the song on MTV. But Kurt declines saying, quote unquote, That's what they did for You Know You're Right. So ultimately, a video would not be made for the song. As there was no band, and Kurt didn't want to have a video with different people very clearly not playing their instruments. A video was proposed, in which it would be a flip book of different Cobain paintings. He declined the idea, and elected to make no videos. The single would be accompanied by a B-side. A song titled Burn the Rain, a two-minute depression. It's very slow and a sad type song. Sounds like the direction Kurt might take after Nirvana is gone. The song was recorded in June of 1996. Talk to Me is the number two single. The song peaked at number six on the Hot 100, three spots below Do Re Mi. The song is fast paced and fun. Full electric guitars brings us back to the Nirvana heyday. The song was written back in 1992 and never recorded in studio until 1996. The B-side to this single is IV League, which is also included on Rohypno, in an instrumental demo of the same song from February 1994, the same day You Know You're Right was recorded, titled Jam After Dinner. Numerous other songs from the album would make the rounds on the radio airwaves throughout 1997. And I Love Her, the Beatles cover, gained massive praise for the composition and the way Cobain rewrote the song the way he did with Man Who Sold the World back in 1993, along with a number of other songs from Unplugged. Paul McCartney would say, quote-unquote, absolutely magical in regards to Cobain's cover. Poison's Gone ended up being a fan favorite track, being requested on the radio stations by the end of January 1997. February 1997. Kurt Cobain turns 30. He's now being pressured to get a band together to tour this album and fulfill prior obligations to his previous tour dates he had cancelled back in 1994. Having no videos for any of the songs really hurt the album sales, relying solely on radio play. Foo Fighters has three videos for its first album, which all gained large rotations on MTV and much music. Nirvana, on the other hand, is falling behind, as it was made pretty clear to the fans that the album would mark the end of the band. The album was for die-hard fans who just wanted more Nirvana music. Kurt had reluctantly agreed to release the product after hours of convincing. He did not want any of this album to ever get released, but he knew he could get out now. All he has to do is fulfill those prior obligations and the contract is done. He doesn't have to release a Nirvana album ever again if he doesn't want to. At this time, Kurt wouldn't do any interviews about the band, nor would any of the previous members of the band. The songs would just maintain radio rotation for the next few months of 1997, while Kurt figures out what he can do next to please his record label. By March of 1997, Courtney Love has started to make the tabloids again, now publicly dating Evan Dando. She has come out to say that she still thinks Kurt is suicidal and that his overdose in October 1996 was a suicide attempt. Cobain would never comment. Billy Corgan would publicly shame Courtney Love for cheating on him. He would also go on to praise Cobain for getting out of that marriage while he had the chance. He would also praise Ro Hypnol and express his desire to work with Kurt in the future. Kurt does not respond. Reviews of Kurt Cobain and Nirvana from fans by mid-1997. Quote-unquote, Kurt Cobain is a ghost. Nirvana is dead, but the songs still hit. 
Nothing will ever top teen spirit. Cobain should have stayed in rehab longer. Great songs, dead band. April 13th, 1997. By this time, having spent a lot of time in his new home, Cobain remained recluse, and now the interior of his home resembles that of an art gallery. Paintings and artwork completely cover the wall. Michael Stipe contacts Kurt Cobain. They talk on the phone for about an hour. Kurt begins working on new music at home, by himself, in the studio he had built into his house. He lets Francis strum the guitars and make sounds into the microphone, similar to himself as a child. Th throughout April of 1997, Kurt focuses solely on weird, ambient sounds and strange amp settings, fully utilizing the powers of his home studio equipment. He no longer has to rely on four-track recording. He begins recording tracks himself, playing all the instruments. Kurt never had this luxury in our real timeline, although he did have the four tracks back in the day. This is a full home studio setup. Kurt died in his prime before he was able to build something like this into his house. Maybe he would have done that if he had not died in 1994. It's safe to say, Kurt Cobain would have thrived by utilizing the newest technologies of the time. He died too early in the 90s to really get to experience some of the best things to come out of the decade, especially for music recording. And definitely with the money he has, he could have easily done it. In this timeline, it was a necessity to him. He thrives with this in-home recording studio. He can do whatever he wants there. While trying to keep his mind free from thinking about heroin, Kurt would clock countless hours of mixing and mastering his own music. He likes producing and using his own creative ideas, rather than paying someone else quote-unquote Millions of dollars to do it. Michael Stipe would later say in an interview, quote unquote, he's just a natural. He completely mixed and mastered an entire album, and it sounds incredible. All by himself. Natural talent. Late April 1997. News breaks out in the media. Mainly MTV and much music about Kurt Cobain retiring from music and becoming a full-time producer. But it is known by those around Kurt at the time that those are all just claims, and so far none of them have proven to be true. It is not confirmed where this news broke. By mid-May of 1997, after hearing about the so-called Cobain producer rumors, Jeff Buckley gets in contact with Kurt Cobain. They talk on the phone for a bit and discuss their passions and loves for different kinds of music. Buckley plans to fly out to Kurt's home studio outside of L.A. They would make the date for June 13th and 14th. They plan to work on a track together with Kurt doing the mixing. Unfortunately, on May 29th, 1997, Jeff Buckley dies by accidental drowning in Memphis. This happens in our real timeline as well. But in this timeline, Kurt is alive and just nearly had a collaboration of sorts with Jeff. Kurt would later go on to say, Wish I could have actually got to meet Jeff. Sounded like a swell guy. He didn't elaborate any further. Kurt now has a fully shaved head and a clean shave. Entirely different look than what we would be used to seeing. Extensive meetings with management and the record label ensue between these few months. It's an ongoing battle with Kurt to keep Nirvana alive. He doesn't want to. He feels like he finished with the band and wants to move on. He tells the label he wants to move on and make a solo record with Michael Stipe and Mark Lanigan, and that Nirvana is quote-unquote, in the past. Kurt explains to the label that they will continue to make quote-unquote, teen spirit money 
for years to come. But management explains to Kurt that if he doesn't clean up his public image in the public perception of Nirvana, that the band and label will be able to maintain a steady income of quote-unquote Nirvana money, as they believe fan interest is at an all-time low since the release of Rohypnol, which is solely relying on radio play rather than full circuit on MTV. Many fans think that the decision was purposely made by Cobain to bring the band back to its punk rock roots and to pull them out of the mainstream. But that is not the case. The band is gone. It's just Cobain that is Nirvana. He feels that he should go on without the name Nirvana and continue on with something fresh, most likely with Michael Stipe from R.E.M. He even joked that maybe he will just join R.E.M. to shut everyone up. People and critics question the name of the album Rohypnol. It is a brand name for a powerful sleeping sedative. Walmart refused to sell the album with its original title and artwork. Management comes up with a new idea to have certain chains of department store carry the album in hopes to boost the sales of the album. They want to re-release the album with a new name, so it can be sold at various department stores who refuse to carry the album based on its name and artwork. Cobain decides he will allow them to re-release the album only if it can be titled Creative Control, which is a jab at management, stating that creative control is something he quote-unquote doesn't have or isn't entitled to with his own band or music. The album cover is completely covered up with the title of the band and the album name. These copies of the album can only be found at places like Walmart and Kmart. Everywhere else is still selling the original release of Rohypnol. Years later, these new versions of the album are sought after by collectors and resold at high value. At this point, it isn't looking like Kurt is interested in getting a new group of guys to play Nirvana songs and embark on a tour with the new album. That idea is pretty much dead. Nirvana is dead, but Kurt Cobain is alive and well. The last album still serves as a wake for Nirvana. It is a sad and very well-written goodbye to the band, but wasn't intended that way when it was recorded. It's just the way it went. The sales are at an all-time low. It sold very well when it released, but f fell further down the chart every week since. At this point in time, Nirvana is being slowly forgotten. A lot of fans have given up. June 1997 Around this time, Kurt and Michael Stipe begin recording material at Kurt's home studio in L.A. The music recorded at this time is just bare-bones ideas, but nowhere close to the quote-unquote teen spirit Cobain that everyone clamored over. Kurt would spend weeks learning how to mix and master his own music. Most of these early songs would never become full songs, but they would soon be leaked in a few years when internet music sharing becomes more prominent. It is said that Mark Lanigan will fly down to L.A. to play with Kurt at the studio, but no demos or recordings would ever surface. Cobain's house is covered in abstract paintings. The walls, windows, even the furniture had some form of artwork attached to it. Painted on by Cobain using various different methods. Still taking methadone, although in lesser doses. Kurt has been spending a lot of time in the studio, often falling asleep at the mixer. He's not doing heroin, but he's still heavy into the downer medications. He has stopped taking Rohypnol after his overdose in October 1996. And now that he named Nirvana's ill-fated final album after the drug, it just seemed quote-unquote cliché to keep taking it. July 1997 Unable to come to grips with his music career and get the band back together to support the recently released Rohypnol, Cobain is forced to give up millions of dollars. He is the sole beneficiary of the Nirvana catalog. Now he's being sued by the record label. He did not fulfill his obligations. He quit halfway through a solid contract. Now he has to pay the price. 
The amount of money is not disclosed. But Cobain doesn't care. He knows after this, it's done. He can move on from all of it. He can quit music forever if he wants to. He's being dropped by the label. Rohypnol isn't holding up well enough for them to keep producing that record. Kurt can go home now and see his daughter, treat her like a daughter and give her a good life, outside of the spotlight. The news of Nirvana being dropped by their label is widespread in the news by the next day. It is a 50-50 split on which fans were mad and which were relieved to see the band officially die. August 1997 Courtney Love would take to the media and seemingly defend Kurt. She was there through the boom period, and she knows how much Kurt and the band were manipulated throughout 1991 and 1994. Courtney stated, Fucking leave Kurt alone. It's all their faults, not his. It's Dave's fault. It's Chris' fault. If it wasn't for them, we'd probably still be fucking married and off doing our own thing. Kurt wouldn't respond to these statements from Courtney Love, but he heard it, and he had seen the interview. It was all over MTV. In an appearance on Much Music Live in September of 1997, Dave Grohl was asked about Nirvana's recent label drop and the breakup of the band. He didn't want to talk about it, but he did go on to say, I think everyone just needed a break. We got too big too fast, and we needed to hit the brakes. He didn't elaborate on Cobain or any of the recording of Rohypnol. At this time, in the fall of 1997, many fans still see Nirvana as a top band in the industry. Although a lot of fans are still clinging on to the Nevermind Glory days, there's a yearning for that grunge sound more than ever as the grunge world has been left in a limbo with the absence of Nirvana from early 1994 to late 1996. With the release of Rohypnol, many fans initially picked the album up on release, with sales dwindling after the first two weeks, due to the album relying solely on radio play, and the band not playing any shows or making any appearances. It was a studio album, and nothing more, and incomplete at that, but it was very clearly Nirvana, and it was very clearly Kurt Cobain. And those songs resonate for years to come, just like the original classics we all know and love today. It's just a different feeling. Great songs with great melodies, just like the previous three albums before it. And mixed well enough to be played on the radio. And did they ever play it on the radio? Because that's the only place it could be heard but it just wasn't enough to hold the band together long enough to cash in on its initial success. Much like Dave felt with Foo Fighters at the beginning. September 20th, 1997. Freshly dropped from his label and being sued for presumably millions of dollars, Kurt plays a show at a dive bar in Seattle as Nirvana. He knows the owner, so it was no issue getting the gig. Michael Stipe flew in to sing the classic Nirvana hits while Kurt solely played guitar. Dale Crover from the Melvins was on drums, and Buzz Osborne played guitar as well. The night prior to this, Chris Novoselic would call Cobain at his home. Chris had good intentions for the call. He was excited to hear about these rumors of Kurt becoming a producer. They talked about Kurt mixing the Sweet 75 album. It was never agreed upon, but it was nice to chat about things that weren't Nirvana. Kurt and Chris could always just be friends. They always were. It didn't have to be about the music. Although, Kurt had told Chris that he's flying out to Seattle tomorrow morning to do an impromptu Nirvana gig. He wasn't going to tell Chris, but he just so happened to call them on the phone, as if it was meant to happen. Kurt told Chris that Michael Stipe would be singing as Kurt felt a little sick that week. Chris couldn't turn down the chance to see his friends again. All he was trying to do was call him and see how he was doing. 
but now he's going to fly out to Seattle in the morning and see him that night at an impromptu Nirvana jam with half of the Melvins, after Nirvana was just dropped from a label and being sued for an undisclosed amount of money. Kurt Cobain is alive and well at this point. He's off heroin. Hasn't touched heroin since 1994. He's been on drugs, though. There's no doubt about that. He still takes pills to go to sleep, and every now and then, he enjoys some downers. But he's also been away from Seattle. He's been away from Courtney. He's been away from Dylan and Callie, and whatever junky friends were still alive. He hadn't seen them in a long time now. He purposely tried to stay away from all of it. He let Courtney have the house in their divorce. He left everything there and started over, and he's still depressed about it. But he sees the bigger picture. He has his daughter. He has his own trusted nanny who does all the meetings. It's been working out for him recently. But now, he's going to go back to Seattle. It's his own doing. He wanted the gig, and he called the guy, and it was all open arms from there. But something inside Kurt was itching to go back to Seattle. Only he knew it. It was some kind of urge he had when he was looking for his next heroin fix of sorts. It was dangerous, and he knew that. But that's what he wanted to do, and nobody could stop him. He didn't care he owed so much money and was dropped from a massive record label. Kurt Cobain was still worth a lot of money, but none of that mattered when you're tied down and forced to produce a product. He felt a comfort in knowing the shackles were finally off. All the while, Courtney has been making headlines all through this, trying to stay relevant. But her story no longer connects with Kurt Cobain in a way that we have to mention everything she has been doing as well. As she is involved with a number of other celebrities with different situations including Billy Corgan and Evan Dando. She still co-parents with Kurt but they haven't seen each other in person in years at this point. The nannies do all the meetings for Francis Bean. Although it is thought that Kurt is still hurt by the whole divorce thing and wishes his family had worked out. His daughter is growing up and now will be able to remember a lot of the back and forth between the two parents. Kurt doesn't think that's a good way to raise a child, similar to how he was raised. He felt like it was destined to be that way. Kurt hasn't been romantically involved with anyone since Courtney Love. The only other person he was remotely interested in passed away in 1994. And that was Kristen Path. He's simply not interested in meeting anyone else. He loves his daughter and is afraid to bring anyone into her life who may just end up leaving or betraying him as he felt Courtney has. Kurt loved Courtney. There's no question about that. He only filed for divorce because he felt like it was too late. She had cheated on him multiple times and he knew it. He didn't believe in all the murder rumors spread by Tom Grant at this point. He's over it. That didn't sit well with him. It was pointless to put himself through the anguish. Kurt has his daughter, but he in fact misses his wife. October 1997 One year after yet another near-death experience when Cobain overdosed on Rohypnol back in 1996, inspiring Nirvana's final attempt at an album. Michael Stipe and Kurt are still working on material at Kurt's studio outside of L.A. Mark Lanigan has joined in on some of the recording, but encourages Kurt and Michael to fly to Seattle, to his own personal studio, where he has better gear and other things he wanted to show them, including some tapes he had been keeping secret. Michael Stipe agrees to fly out to Seattle. Kurt isn't quite sure about going to Seattle just yet. He still has too many connections to Seattle. Last time he was there, it was just one night, and he was gone the next day. But he ultimately agrees. Besides, he will be with Michael Stipe. They set a date to fly to Seattle in the following week. Michael and Kurt fly to Seattle separately from their own homes. 
They will meet at the airport and drive to Mark Lanigan's personal studio together. Courtney Love is out of town. Her band Hall is recording a new album. Courtney is in L.A. Kurt has no idea where she is or what she's doing, let alone the fact that she's in L.A. Francis Bean will be at home outside of L.A. with the nanny. Kurt is going to Seattle. October 20th, 1997. Kurt arrives at the airport and is ambushed by paparazzi and fans clamoring to get a good look at him. He has short hair, almost shaved down to the skull, and clean shaven. He's surprisingly super happy to see everyone and smiles for the cameras, as well as signs random things very quickly as he walks through the wave of people. You could tell it was an act. He was just trying to, quote unquote, get the fuck out of there. He just wanted to leave. Somehow, someone found out Kurt was on his way to Seattle and told all the local media outlets. Everyone showed up just to get a picture of this fabled rock star. This isn't a Kurt anyone is used to seeing. The last time anyone has seen Kurt on TV was before Rohypnol was released. He had the beard and the long hair and looked like a hippie back then. These new photographs of Kurt show the human side of him. He's still alive and out of his hole. But this is Seattle. And Kurt left Seattle for a reason. After arriving at Mark Lanigan's house in Seattle, this new band quickly begins working on fresh material after Mark would show Michael and Kurt some top secret stuff he hasn't shown anyone. Only one tape exists. Kurt and Michael give their thoughts on the tracks and start to add their own parts to the music. Kurt would lay down the drum tracks behind his acoustics. Michael Stipe would pluck away at the bass and Michael and Mark would share singing duties on the new music. Kurt would provide subtle backup vocals. The recordings of these songs would continue for the next few weeks, being recorded back and forth between Cobain and Lanigan's houses. For the first time in a long time, Kurt felt like he was part of a band, and that the creative control doesn't lay solely on his shoulders. He liked the feeling of being able to sit behind a drum kit, hidden away from the glam of being a rock star, but still being able to be a part of the creative process in the music making. Courtney Love would make a comment in a tabloid newspaper stating that she's been with all the most famous rock stars around right now, and that nobody rocked her world quite like Cobain. In a blatant lie, Love states that her and Kurt are on good terms and that they remain in contact frequently, but it is known that Cobain hasn't seen Love or talked to her since late 1994, early 1995. Around this time, Courtney Love has been arranging visits to see her daughter while recording her album in L.A., while Kurt is away to Seattle for recording. Courtney would attempt to arrange meetings with Francis Bean at Kurt's home outside of L.A. Kurt is not yet aware of this at this time. Cobain, still going through ongoing legal battles with Nirvana's management, after disbanding Nirvana and backing out halfway through a major tour, Cobain is financially liable, and by this point, his career is nowhere near where it was back in the early 90s. As we get closer to the end of the decade, Kurt has moved on from Nirvana. He has no intentions on reviving the band or using the name. He doesn't want to be a rock star, but he still loves making music. He's worried about losing his home due to the lawsuits. He knows he has money regardless thanks to quote-unquote teen spirit money, but without a band or any type of income to support him, it's hard to say how long he can stand on his own. This new band, with Mark Lanigan and Michael Stipe, has just been them making music together. Nothing serious behind it. Kurt hasn't even considered the idea of this music being released to the public. November 1997 Kurt hasn't been seen in the public eye for quite some time, other than some cheap smut tabloid images that were taken of him at the airport last month. Fans still listen to Rohypnol, as well as the other Nirvana albums. Nevermind is still their top album, and always will be, in this timeline as well. 
Nirvana's mark will always be left, no matter what. Back in 1991, Nirvana changed the entire course of rock music. That legacy will always stand tall. Fans still love In Utero and Bleach respectively, and Rohypnol has a new place in their hearts. A feeling that we can never truly experience in our real timeline. Instead, in this timeline, Kurt Cobain was with us long enough to give us one more album. The album we always wished for, but couldn't have. Now we have just a bit more to put us in that place that Kurt's music puts us. This goes to show that even the slightest addition to the Nirvana catalog could be catastrophic to fans. Nirvana truly is a sacred band to its fans, and to rock music as a whole. In November of 1997, Kirk gets a hold of the nanny who takes care of Frances Bean when she's with Courtney in the Lake Washington home. In these calls, he demands to talk to Courtney Love about the attempted meeting arrangements in L.A. when Kurt isn't around. He does not get a hold of Courtney directly during this time. Later in the week, Kurt is out at a diner with a few friends one afternoon in L.A. And he runs into Callie DeWitt, who's been staying in L.A. since mid-1994, back and forth between L.A. and Calabasas. The two have a cigarette together and reminisce, and then the two part ways shortly afterward. Tom Grant always believed Callie DeWitt and Courtney Love conspired to have Kurt Cobain murdered back in 1994. None of these claims could ever be proven, still to this day. What's the point if Kurt's still alive? The murder plot had failed. Tom's book sold, but it didn't sell well. A lot of fans thought of it as a quick cash grab fan fiction story to cash in on the Kurt Cobain name since he was making so many headlines at the time. Same with Courtney Love. They were just easy scapegoats. Tom has moved on from the subject ever since his book bombed. We will not hear about him again in this story. Kurt Cobain and Mark Lanigan start hanging out a lot more by the end of 1997. The issue here is that Mark Lanigan is still not clean of heroin like Cobain is. However, he claims to be. Ever since completing his rehab program back in early 1996, somewhere along the way, he relapsed. And he kept it very secret. By late 1997, Kurt Cobain is still on the downer medication. And he's been drinking. By no means is he an alcoholic. But drinking any type of alcohol and swallowing pills can be a very deadly combination. Michael Stipe would finish his parts in the new music this recent group has been working on. And he would then stop attending the recording sessions so he could work on new material with R.E.M. Still no word on if any of this new music will be released to the world. And if it does, what are we supposed to call this band? At this time, none of this is public. Nobody knows Kurt Cobain has been recording music with Mark Lanigan and Michael Stipe in Seattle and L.A. Work with Michael Stipe and Mark Lanigan was hinted at in 1995 in that interview Kurt did. But other than that, fans and friends of Kurt alike have no idea this project is actually in the works. Billy Corgan would now officially denounce Nirvana and Kurt Cobain, and Courtney Love, as well as pretty much the entire alternative rock scene, and grunge music as a whole, which he considers quote-unquote dead. Corgan would go on to say that he wrote most of Hole's upcoming album and that Courtney quote-unquote ripped the songs out of my hands and called them her own. Courtney and Evan Dando would split it this time. She is spotted with Edward Norton around the end of 1997, but it is not thought that they were dating. Courtney makes subtle mentions of Kurt Cobain every now and then. December 1997 After hours of mixing and mastering his own work at this private studio in his home outside of L.A., Kurt feels like the work he finished with Michael Stipe and Mark Lanigan needs to be released and heard by the world. 
although at this time, he doesn't seek out record labels and production companies to put this record out. Instead, he opts to form his own independent label. The music doesn't have a name. The band consisting of Kurt, Mark, and Michael doesn't have a name. Only half of the songs have titles. By December of 1997, Kurt has been in non-stop legal battles over Nirvana and Geffen Records since the spring of 1997. At this time, the lawsuit is settled out of court. It is highly believed Kurt had a great relationship with his label and managers, so they decided to take it easy on Kurt. They knew about his condition and his addictions. It didn't seem right to put all the blame for Nirvana's failures onto Kurt's shoulders. Nirvana will always hold a legacy, and the label knew that. They regretted dropping the band from the label, but they felt that they had to, as it was costing more money for them and creating bad publicity to keep the band afloat on the label, especially considered the entire band is gone. It was just Kurt at this point. Kurt wouldn't have to dish out the millions to cover lost time. Instead, a deal was worked out in which Kurt would only receive 5% of revenue from future Nirvana sales. Nirvana albums would no longer be produced, meaning no new copies will ever be printed under the Geffen label, although Geffen has warehouses full of Nevermind and previous other Nirvana albums ready to be sold, and they will sell them. Nirvana albums would still be sold under GGC. Technically, Geffen owns these albums. Kurt really has no rights to his previously released music at this point. Geffen would take claim to 95% of all profits. And Kurt would take home a tiny fraction of this money, a very small percentage compared to what he was getting before the band was dropped by the label. He doesn't have to lose his home, and he doesn't have to feel shackled down by ongoing lawsuits. Now he is free to do what he wants, and now he is free to go wherever he wants. He doesn't have any dates he needs to meet, he can even leave the United States if he wanted to at this point. There was no rope tied to him holding him back. The Nirvana lawsuits being finished is a huge relief for Kurt. Now all Kurt must do is get himself stable enough to create an income for himself. This new independent label he wants to start could be the first step towards that new life. With help from Michael Stipe, Kurt's new independent label titled Abort Christ Records is being picked up by Capitol Records as a parent company. Capitol had always shown interest in working with Kurt Cobain's musical talents, seeing how well Nevermind sold back in 1991. Although, Capitol would not allow this new label to be titled Abort Christ. So instead, Cobain changed the name to Sell Out Records. Now Kurt would be able to release his own music under his own label, and now he can receive more of the revenue from the sales of this new music. This time, however, he is not the sole songwriter. It's a three-way split between himself, Stipe, and Lanigan, who are all fantastic musicians in their own respect. Courtney gets in contact with Kurt Cobain at his home studio to talk more about the supposed meeting arrangements while he's been away. They talk for at least an hour, with no yelling or arguing to be noted from these conversations. The End of 1997 No name for this project exists yet, only a handful of songs have actual names and written lyrics, but it's looking like this new project will release under Cobain's newly formed independent label, possibly slated for a 1998 release. On Christmas Day, Kurt Cobain decides to call Courtney Love at the Lake Washington home in Seattle, as Frances Bean is with her for Christmas this year. They speak on the phone for hours. Kurt even speaks with Frances over the phone. This is his first Christmas without her, and he just wishes he could spend one more Christmas Day as a family. But things change, and so do people. And it's hard to say what's going through Courtney Love's mind as well as Kurt's mind at this time. Kurt is becoming lo known locally around town for his producing skills. 
He wants to pursue that more, as well as writing and recording his own music at home, free from the shackles of a big-time record label. He now has the means of releasing anything he wants to express his full creativity. Kurt and Michael Stipe, along with Mark Lanigan, are coming up with concept ideas for this new project they had worked on throughout 1997, with a potential 1998 release. But how well will it fare? What does it sound like? These are questions on everyone's minds. Casual Nirvana fans don't know this project even exists yet. It hasn't been announced other than a few mentions by Cobain and Stipe in various interviews. Around this time, Kurt begins having ideas of opening up his house as an art gallery, although at this time, it is just a thought in his head, and nothing more. This will conclude, if Kurt Cobain lived, 1997. We hope you enjoyed listening, and please stay tuned for If Kurt Cobain Lived, 1998.